you are watching Redicon. So now we're going to move to the labral abnormalities or shoulder instabilities. Uh, so the glenohumeral joint by default, uh, by nature, is the most unstable joint in the body. It's the most mobile and has a wide range of motion and commonly dislocated uh, joint. Shoulder instability is a common clinical problem, particularly in young athletes, and can be classified in unidire unidirectional, which is much, much more common, and anterior instability is the most common. Posterior and inferior are least. Multidirectional is uh, can happen, particularly in certain sport, but it is less common. Still, for a shoulder orthogram, uh, I do a conventional orthogram. Uh, sorry, for shoulder instability, I do MRI conventional orthogram. Uh, and I think it's, it's still uh, is the best for me to give a proper uh, evaluation of the joint itself. And it is the modality of choice. Not only for the orthogram part, actually it's more for the distinction. So there are two ways uh, how to do the orthogram. The direct, which is the conventional orthogram, when we inject the diluted gadolinium inside the joint and then do MRI. And the indirect, which I don't do, is by injecting the IV gadolinium, let the patient do some exercise. So that's going to allow some bowling of contrast inside the joint and do uh, delayed images 10 to 15 minutes after. I don't do it. I don't think it helped me a lot. Some people, and I think you're probably right with the three Tesla and high resolution, we might get rid of the orthogram because it gave you a very detailed. Still, I do them. I like the, the idea of distinction. How we do it, we do it usually the orthogram under either uh, ultrasound or fluoroscopy. I do it under fluoroscopy through anterior approach and I inject contrast usually to make sure I am in the joint after sterilization. If I am in the joint, I start to inject between 10 to 15 cc of diluted gadolinium and then send the patient to MRI. In MRI, usually you get a very beautiful anatomy. You can see here actually this is we are at the inferior part of the joint. You can see some of the contrast pulling around the tendon, around the biceps within the tendon sheet. So this is the biceps. This is the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. As we are moving more uh, superiorly, you can see beautifully the anterior and posterior labrum, triangular, do low, a low signal. There is no overlapping with the, or, uh, uh, with the adjacent subscapularis, and that's the beauty of the direct orthogram. More superiorly, you can see this is the subscapularis. There is some structure overshape between the anterior labrum and the subscapularis. This is the middle glenohumeral ligament. You can see the glenoid cartilage, the hyaline cartilage, beautifully here. And in coronal, you can see the, uh, the origin of the bi bicipital tendon from the superior labrum. In sagittal, you can see the superior glenohumeral ligament. And this is the long head of biceps at crossing adjacent to the superior humeral head. A two spectrum of pathology can affect this, uh, the labrum, and we're going to talk about them touch base only in each one. The superior labral abnormality, and this is what we classify them as slab lesions, superior labral, anterior, and posterior. So it does involve the superior labrum with anterior or posterior extension. And we get the anterior instability that does affect the anterior and inferior part of the labrum, which is the Bankert and Bankert variant. I'm not going to go through uh, all these. There are lots of terminology names. For me, the best thing is to describe rather than to try to fit it in one of these category. But we can we can just go through them. We have the soft tissue bankert when you get injury of the bank uh, of the anterior inferior labrum, affecting only the labrum or cartilage. Osseous when you have osseous component. Berthi's legion. I show you example of this. Alpsa which is the anterior labral ligamentous periosteal sleeve of Vulcan. I'll show you an example of this. A GLAD, where is, when we have the glenolabral articular disruption, when the glenoid cartilage is involved, 
and slab 5, it is uh, extension all the way to the superior labrum. Capsular lesion, when you have humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, they call it Hegel. If you have a bony avulsion, we call it a bony Hegel. And Gegel, when you get a avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament from the glenoid side, and I'll show you an example of this. For bony, we look usually for Helsac lesion or a greater tuberosity fracture. So this is an example of Bankert. Usually get the uh, tear of the anterior labrum and disruption of the capsule. Berthes, you have still the capsule and periosteum intact, but however, the tear uh, is there. Perthes, it was given a special entity because when you do the MRI, things can look like in a normal position. When you stretch a little bit the labrum, you can see the tracking of the contrast or the fluid in between. That's why some people do special maneuvers, which is the Aber position. Osseus Bankert, Alpsa, when you get displacement of the labrum, with elevation of periosteum, a glad when you have involvement of the glenoid cartilage. Example, soft tissue bankert, you get clearly here, actually depression along the humeral head. This is the anterior and this is the posterior labrum. Posterior labrum looks fine. If you look to the anterior labrum, there is a cleft dissecting the anterior labrum from the underlying glenoid. So this is the anterior labral tear or soft tissue bankert. We're gonna give the location. Uh, I'm just gonna go back here just for a second. Whenever we get a glenoid uh, or labral, a glenoid labral abnormality, we refer to it in a clock position. How to do the clock? Always the bicipital uh, or the origin superior labrum at 12 inferior labrum at six, anteriorly three, and posteriorly nine. This is the usual area of uh, Bankert Legion. Another example here, you can see there is depression at the superior lateral humeral head, and there is actually complete tear of the anterior labrum. You can see here the posterior labrum here, you lose completely the triangular appearance, and there is actually retraction medially. So this is more of Alpsa legion, and even the anterior cartilage is involved. So that's why I don't like to, yeah, for here probably I'll say glad with Alpsa, so I rather describe the abnormality rather than try to fit it in one name. Here there is a bony and soft tissue bankert legion with involvement with anterior. Here again, you get a bony loss with tear of the labrum. So this is a soft tissue and osseous bankert. So you can see here, this is an orthogram. You can see how is the inferior axillary recess of the joint is really spacious, and there is extravasation of the contrast between the humeral head and the glenohumeral ligament. You can see here it's fuzzy, irregular. So this is actually a vulgin of the gleno inferior glenohumeral ligament from the humeral size will allow the contrast to here. So the ligament is avulsed. This is the normal ligament. This is the avulsed part. This will allow the contrast to go here. So this is what we call the Hegel humeral avulsion of the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. Another example here. However, in the axial images appear that the ligament actually is avulsed from the glenoid side, not from the humeral side. So this is the Gegel or the glenohumeral ligament. Most important thing to mention, there is uh, actually a disruption of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Multidirectional instability, you can see here orthogram, you can see the a tear in the anterior and posterior labrum. So this is usually an example of multidirectional instability. Before I leave this area, with the anterior instability, there is an evolving imaging technique, and this is just to match the demand of the surgeon. Now, I'm, I didn't talk to 
about it too much because I don't have time, but you should know. Now the uh, surgeon demand actually to see how much loss, let me just go back here, how much bony loss either from the humeral side or from the glenoid side. And this is where we come to the idea of off track and or on track, just to see how much, if you do just regular repair, are we gonna be a uh, uh, fairly stable joint or not? I'm not gonna go deeply in this. Okay, this is a labral tear with paralabral cyst. If I see cystic area adjacent to the posterior labrum, that's indicate uh, labral uh, tear with paralabral cyst. If I see a cyst, I have to look carefully for any uh, nerve uh, impingement. Here is another example. You can see there is the irregularity of the posterior labrum with a paralabral cyst living in the spinoglenoid fossa. You look carefully if there is any nerve entrapment. You can see here actually there is abnormal signal within the infraspinatus muscle when you compare it to the sobra. This is related to denervation edema related to the nerve entrapment of suprascapular nerve. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the notification bell for new courses. For more modules and radiology CMAs, please visit www.radicon.org.